on World News Tonight. Monster Monsoon. Half a million homes destroyed by floods in Pakistan as the nation pleads for international help. Urgent mission. UN inspectors head to the nuclear power plant in Ukraine to prevent potential nuclear disaster. Baghdad violence. Maktada al Sadr supporters storm Iraqi palace after Shia cleric steps down. And dancers chasse. Ukraine's national ballet performs in Orlando since its invasion. This is Other Than Arena World News Tonight. Reporting from Colombo, here is Suzanne Chanelli. A very good evening and thank you for joining us on World News tonight and we begin with the catastrophic floods that are drowning Pakistan. Nearly a half a million people crowded into camps after losing their homes in a widespread flooding and the climate minister warned that Pakistan is on the front line of the world's climate crisis after unprecedented monsoon rains wrecked the country since mid-June, killing over a thousand people. Sailing to safety. These residents have been made homeless by the floods. We are poor people. If the water recedes from our homes, we will go back. Our home was destroyed. Our belongings disappeared in the big flood. Our children are waiting on the bank without food and without shelter. The rain has finally stopped, with dry weather forecast for the coming week. Authorities estimate one third to a quarter of Pakistan could be underwater following the most extreme monsoon rains seen in the country in three decades. I haven't seen any, any destruction or devastation of this scale. I find it very difficult uh, to put into words uh, the phraseologies that we're used to, whether it's monsoon rains or uh, flooding, doesn't quite seem uh, to encapsulate the ongoing devastation and disaster that we're still witnessing. Southern provinces are bracing for fresh flooding flowing down through swollen rivers from the north. Relief operations are hampered by a lack of landing strips and treacherous flying conditions, while millions of acres of rich farmland have been flooded with devastating effects for the country's crops. According to our estimates, it's destroyed around 80% of our date crops. Then, from the rest of the 20%, I would say 5 to 10% is damaged. The government has declared an emergency and appealed for international help. On Sunday, the first aid flights began arriving from Turkey and the UAE. A UN nuclear watchdog team set off on an urgent mission to safeguard the Russian-occupied Zaporizhia atomic power plant at the heart of fighting in Ukraine. A long-awaited trip the world hopes will help avoid a radioactive catastrophe. A 14-person IAEA team is on its way to Ukraine's Zaporizhia nuclear power plant. The International Atomic Energy Agency's chief tweeted that they must protect the safety and security of Ukraine's and Europe's biggest nuclear facility, adding that he was proud to lead the mission to the plant later this week. For Ukraine's foreign minister, the stakes couldn't be higher. But without an exaggeration, this mission will be the hardest uh, in the history of IAEA, given the active combat activities uh, undertaken by the Russian Federation on the ground, and also the very blatant uh, way that uh, Russia is trying to legitimize its presence. The plant has been occupied by Russian forces and run by Ukrainian workers since the early days of the war, and has been the target of strikes in recent weeks. There are fears there could be a massive radiation leak. The IAEA says the mission now will assess physical damage to the facility, determine functionality of safety and security systems, evaluate staff conditions, and perform safeguards. The 14 experts come from countries that openly support Ukraine, as well as from others like Serbia and China that are closer to Russia. Moscow accuses Ukraine of recklessly firing on Zaporizhia. We have waited a long time for that mission, and we consider it necessary. We believe that all countries must raise pressure on the Ukrainian side to force it to stop threatening the European continent by shelling the territory of the Zaporizhia nuclear power plant and surrounding areas. As soon as Russia withdraws 
Ukraine says Russia is essentially holding it hostage, storing weapons there and launching attacks from around it. Ukraine said it broke through enemy lines in several places near the southern city of Kherson as it pressed a new campaign to retake territory while Moscow said Kyiv's counteroffensive had failed as Russia shelled the port city of Mykolaiv. The Ukrainian military said it launched a long-awaited counteroffensive to take back territory from Russian forces in its south on Monday, bolstered by weaponry supplied by the West. Moscow acknowledged the offensive by Ukraine near the city of Kherson, but also said it had failed and that Ukrainians had suffered significant casualties. Meanwhile, Russian shells bombarded the southern port city of Mykolaiv. The city's mayor said homes had been hit and at least two people killed. This latest Ukrainian offensive comes after weeks of bloody stalemate in the war. The conflict broke out when Russian troops poured over Ukraine's borders in February in what Russia calls a special military operation to rid Ukraine of nationalists and protect Russian-speaking communities. Ukraine calls it an unprovoked war of aggression. Thousands have been killed, millions displaced, and the scale of fighting is larger than anything in Europe since World War II. Russia captured much of the South early on. Now Ukraine's using sophisticated Western-supplied weapons to hit Russian ammunition dumps and wreak havoc with supply lines. A spokesperson for Ukraine's Southern Command declined to give details of the counteroffensive, saying Russian forces in southern Ukraine remained quite powerful. Heavy clashes erupted in Baghdad, killing almost 20 people after powerful Shiite cleric Maktada al-Sadr said that he would quit politics, prompting his loyalists to storm a government palace and fight with the rival groups. A crowd of protesters stormed the Iraqi government palace, clashing with security forces, shooting live rounds of ammunition and diving into the palace swimming pool. After cleric Maktada al-Sadr announced his final withdrawal from politics via Twitter, hundreds of his supporters forced their way through the palace gates, prompting the cabinet to suspend a session. The leader, God bless him, delegated the issue to the people. We, the Iraqi people, including Sunnis, Shiites and Kurds, are one hand against the corrupt. Our leader says he does not stand with a certain political group. He retreated twice from the alliance. The military soon announced a nationwide curfew, calling on the cleric's supporters to withdraw immediately from the heavily fortified government zone. Iraq's government has been deadlocked since Maktada al sadr's party won the largest share of seats in October elections, but not enough to secure a majority government. He refused to negotiate with Iran-backed Shiite rebels to form a consensus. The current impasse means Iraq is now in its longest run without a government. In July, al sadr's supporters broke into the parliament to deter his rivals. They've been staging a sit-in outside the building for the past month. A highly influential cleric who led revolts during the U.S.-led occupation, al sadr has drawn broad support by opposing both U.S. and Iranian influence on Iraqi politics. Over in the U.S., the Director of National Intelligence has ordered a damage report as the Mar-a-Lago search fallout continues, as a judge seems to likely appoint a special master to reveal the materials. The DOJ told the court that the in initial sorting of documents has been completed. Trump's team pushed back, saying that they have a lot of problems really accepting at face value everything that's coming out of the DOJ. Tonight, measuring the Mar-a-Lago search fallout. The Director of National Intelligence has ordered a damage report, an assessment of the potential risk to national security. Today, the White House distanced itself and said it did not request that review, and President Biden has received no information. I can say that he has not been briefed. Eleven sets of classified materials were seized, and another 184 classified documents were recovered earlier from the Trump residence, according to the Department of Justice, who today told the court they did find a limited set of what could be attorney-client privileged information seized by the FBI during the search. Protected documents the former president's lawyers cited when he sued the U.S. government. 
asking a federal judge to name an independent party to review all material taken. The judge indicated she is likely to grant that special master. Today, the Department of Justice told the court that the initial sorting of documents has already been completed. But Mr. Trump's team pushed back. We have a lot of problems really accepting everything at face value that's coming out of DOJ these days. It's a very politicized place, I'm sad to say. When he was a candidate, Donald Trump pledged to protect official secrets. In my administration, I'm going to enforce all laws concerning the protection of classified information. But Trump ally Lindsey Graham suggests any charges could actually lead to violence. I'll say this. If there's a prosecution of Donald Trump for mishandling classified information, there'll be riots in the streets. Let's go into a short commercial break. We'll be back soon with more world news. Welcome back to World News Tonight. Now, since the onset of COVID-19 in South Korea, there have been fewer cases of influenza. However, that could be about to change. The latest statistics show that the number of suspected flu patients in South Korea is at its highest level in five years. The seasonal flu is back, and it's been spreading increasingly rapidly since this summer. Suspected influenza patients who showed symptoms like a cough and sore throat, along with a high fever of at least 38 degrees Celsius, increased to 4.2 out of 1,000 outpatients in the third week of August. The figure marked the highest level in five years. Unlike last year, this year the number of influenza patients is increasing little by little. Originally, there weren't as many as there are now. Experts point out that the flu virus may have arrived from the Southern Hemisphere and Southeast Asia, such as Australia, where the flu had spread earlier as overseas travel increased. There's no social distancing and the herd immunity to the flu is low. Not to mention they're planning to get rid of PCR tests for inbound travelers, so the twindemic might come earlier than expected. The so-called twindemic poses a greater threat to high-risk and elderly patients. Due to similar symptoms shown in COVID-19 and influenza, the confusion may delay proper treatment. Experts also say that with many South Koreans having been vaccinated for COVID-19, less are willing to be vaccinated for influenza. With the government set to announce its COVID-19 vaccine plans for the latter half of the year, medical experts hope it will also push for more people to get the flu vaccine this fall. An engine problem forced NASA to postpone for at least four days the debut launch of the colossal rocket ship. It hopes will one day fly astronauts back to the moon more than half a century after Apollo's last lunar mission. Monday's rocket launch aimed to send a 32-story next-generation super rocket on a trial run around the moon. A successful test would represent a giant leap for NASA's Artemis mission, aiming to return astronauts to the lunar surface after 50 years, and one day even to carry them to Mars. But blastoff never happened. The delay was called at 8.35 a.m. Eastern Time, two minutes after the targeted launch, with this announcement. This is Artemis Launch Control. With an update, Launch Director Charlie Blackwell Thompson has called a scrub for today. The U.S. Space Agency cited a problem on one of the rocket's main engines as launch teams began a test that would have cooled the engines for liftoff. But one would not cool as expected. This is a brand new rocket. It's not going to fly until it's ready. NASA Administrator Bill Nelson said that last-minute snags and cancellations were a standard part of what he called the space business. So when you're dealing in a high-risk business and space flight is risky, uh, that's what you do. You buy down that risk, you make it as safe as possible, and of course, that is the whole reason for this test flight. The mission, dubbed Artemis 1, calls for a six-week uncrewed test flight of the Orion space capsule around the moon and back to Earth for a splashdown in the Pacific. Build as the most powerful complex rocket in the world, the Space Launch System, or SLS, represents the biggest new vertical launch system NASA has built since the Saturn V rocket flown during the Apollo missions that landed the first humans on the moon more than a half century ago. 
it's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. With a rocket built by Boeing and the Orion crew capsule designed by Lockheed Martin, Monday's mission was meant to put the 5.75 million pound vehicle through a rigorous demo flight, pushing the limits of its design before NASA deems it reliable enough to carry astronauts into space. Monday's launch was set to carry a simulated crew of three, one male and two female mannequins fitted with sensors to measure radiation levels and other stresses that real-life astronauts would experience. The Artemis mission, named after Apollo's twin sister in Greek mythology, seeks to eventually return humans to the moon and establish a long-term lunar base there, to be used as a stepping stone to even more ambitious astronaut voyages to Mars. NASA officials say that goal is probably decades away. Shorter term, officials on Monday said they hoped to try again in 96 hours and make a second launch attempt Friday. We have some good news for you. Now, dementia is the most common degenerative brain disease associated with aging. Many scientists are searching for a cure, and one Korean biotech company has developed a new type of electroceutical therapy, which combines electronics and pharmaceuticals. South Korea's aging population is increasing, and with it is a rise in dementia, a disease with no cure or effective treatment. The main cause of dementia has been known to be abnormality in the beta amyloid, but recent treatments that target this amino acid have seen low efficacy. Among the hypotheses surrounding the cause of dementia, poor blood flow to the brain has also been pointed out as an important cause. Blood circulation delivers various nutrition to each nerve cell, so reduced blood flow restricts the supply of nutrition and oxygen to the nervous system. Now, a Korean biotech company is in the process of developing an electronic device that could help improve cerebrovascular flow. Using what's called photobiomodulation therapy, which uses light sources including LEDs and lasers, the company is developing coin-sized electronic stickers. The sticker patch is placed on the back of a patient's neck. When light is applied, the device emits visible light rays, which relax the capillaries in the brain, improving blood flow to the brain. The capillaries are relaxed by stimulating the nerve endings in the dermis or epidermis, which causes the secretion of nitrogen oxide from blood vessels inside the brain or nerve cells around lymph nodes. The research team also added that results from a small-scale clinical trial on patients with mild cognitive impairment in the early stages of dementia did confirm significant improvement. They used a cognitive evaluation test called a K-MOCA test, a Korean version of the Montreal Cognitive Assessment. One patient scored 20 points on the initial K-MOCA test. After the treatment, they scored 22 points. It's well known that even a single point change in the MOCA test is very difficult to achieve, so an increase of two points shows high efficacy. Results also showed that this treatment improved blood flow in the frontal lobe of the brain that's related to cognitive function. It will now undergo larger-scale trials. Welcome back to World News Tonight, and for more news, let's take you around the world in a minute. Musicians in Colombia have broken the world record for the biggest concert ever performed. Some 16,000 singers, children's choirs and musicians gathered in Bogota to perform a range of songs with some of the pieces leveling criticism at the political and social issues. South Korean artists won big at the MTV Video Music Awards. BTS continued their winning streak with MTV viewers naming them Group of the Year. Award for Best K-Pop went to Blackpink's member Lisa. China's southern city of Shenzhen escalated COVID-19 restrictions as it closed more businesses, renewing economic uncertainty and delaying the start of the school year for some. And that's all the news we got for you tonight. Join us again tomorrow for more news around the globe. In case you missed to watch any of the stories we aired tonight, you can always re-watch by catching us on our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash English. And finally, we are leaving you tonight with ballet dancers twirling and gliding across the stage in Orlando in the National Ballet of Ukraine's first performance in the U.S. since the Russian invasion. Stay safe and have a good night.